a hardcore Austrian economist, as a hardcore uh, adherent to the law of diminishing marginal utility, like there comes a point where adding, bolting on more ideas and things onto Bitcoin reduces the marginal utility thereof. Because it's just, you're making a software project more complicated. Well, what's the big knock in the in, against Ethereum from the beginning? How are you going to run all of this code on this monolithic, slow, proof of work blockchain? Well, the answer was always, you're not. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys. And by IVPN. Resist online surveillance with IVPN, a privacy-focused, audited, and transparent VPN provider that accepts Monero directly. Cake Wallet and IVPN are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you, and supporting us is easier than ever by typing in MoneroTalk.crypto in your Cake Wallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Tom Luongo, an OG Bitcoiner, proof of work, crypto maxi, with knowledgeable insights into geopolitics and much more. Tom shares his thoughts on cryptocurrencies, past, current, and future state, and compares Bitcoin and Monero in terms of digital gold and digital cash. Monero Talk starts now. Tom, how's it going? Ah, good afternoon, Doug. How are you? Good, good, good. Thank you for uh, taking the time to jump on Monero Talk. I greatly appreciate it. I know you're a, a busy man. Yeah, well, you know, busy is fine. I don't have a problem with that. I like, you know, I like Monero. So I like, I like all proof of work style coins. Like I'm, I, when it comes to that, I, I, I make the Bitcoin maxis really angry because I, I just call myself a proof of work maxi. Um, is, you know. is that true? So is that those are the ones that you uh, yeah yeah, yeah without a doubt. Okay, I, I, and I and I believe that, and I believe Bitcoin is great is, is great alpha code, and it's you know maybe the beta code now. Um, I just one of those things where I, I I think you know the concept of proof of work as a trustless you know validating system. I think it's phenomenal. I think there's it's a great basis for going forward. And building this technology off of and as and create reserve assets or foundational assets of a new monetary system. Um, I don't necessarily believe that Bitcoin is it. And I'm taught when I say that, I mean that in the 30 year time horizon. I don't mean that in the next six to nine months or three year time horizon. Um, and so I think that, you know, as software projects, um, if something is not purpose built from the ground up to do a particular thing and do it well then you're asking for trouble trying to bolt new things onto it later on. Couldn't so, agree with you more, man. So what, what do you think Bitcoin was purpose-built for then from the ground up? What do you think it's- um, To be a digital analog to gold and nothing more and a proof of concept. I don't believe that Bitcoin was meant to be the end-all and be-all of a proof-of-work style blockchain. If so, they would never, Satoshi would have never set the parameters that he would have set. One meg block size, 10 minute block times, you know, halvings every four years, like all the whole nine yards. None of it makes any sense from a, I'm, I'm, and I'm, and I know that Bitcoin Maxis will yell at me about this. And for, and for, for the record, I know the original Bitcoin Maxi. He's a friend of mine. The guy that Vitalik yelled at, Junset. Junset's a friend. Oh, of mine. Yeah, yeah. I've argued, yeah. I've yeah. argued yeah. Bitcoin maximalism yeah. with Junset, you know, for hours over, cigars and whiskey like oh it's, awesome. oh yeah so and he he but, was friends with uh chris uh what the what's the guy like other characters name they used to do that show together that podcast yeah, they used to do junset's world right yeah and yeah, yeah. Uh, or the bitcoin podcast or whatever yeah. and like and junset's a great guy don't get me wrong i i think and he's absolutely and he's a brilliant human being and and he's a brilliant he's a brilliant arguer like he's the best i've ever seen at using the socratic method to trap your opponents into their in, the, in a maze of their own logic and I think he's phenomenal. I think he's brilliant. And I love the guy. And I can't wait to go down to visit um, South Florida. I'll get to see him next week um, when I get when I go down uh, uh, for a trip down there. the The thing is, is that you know I, I argued him to a standstill about these basic ideas, like you know you because John says basic argument. And most Bitcoin maxis, well, you know, uh, what about privacy? Well, Bitcoin can do that. 
Well, what about this? Well, Bitcoin can do that. Well, what about that? Well, Bitcoin can do that. What about NFTs? Well, Bitcoin can do that. Yeah, but the, the question isn't whether Bitcoin can do it. The question, better question is, is whether Bitcoin should do it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that is the thing that I, as a, as a, as a hardcore Austrian economist, as a hardcore uh, adherent to the law of diminishing marginal utility, like there comes a point where adding, bolting on more ideas and things onto Bitcoin reduces the marginal utility thereof, because it's just, you're making a software project more complicated. Well, what's the big knock in the, in, against Ethereum from the beginning? How are you going to run all of this code on this monolithic, slow, proof-of-work blockchain? Well, the answer was always, you're not, which is why they have to move the proof of stake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so you got into you got into crypto, I think, pretty early. I just recently learned of you, by the way, man. Right, um, right. I, and a lot of people have. Yeah, somebody, uh, you know, one of my one of my my fans or followers pointed to me like, yo, you got to get this guy on the show. He knows his right. stuff. He knows geopolitics. He knows economics. I uh, I th he, I think he's mentioned the M word, the Monero word. You know, he's I, not, I like Monero. Super. I own Monero. I, I like it. I have. I own a bit. I own a little bit. So let me let me get right to so the big question. So fungibility, right? So Bitcoin sure. arguably isn't fungible. It's trying to be digital gold. How do you how how do you square those things? How how it's, is it? It isn't. It, it, you're right. It isn't necessarily fungible, but that's okay. It doesn't need to be, right? Um, but I, I mean, gold fungible, right? Because you yeah, said gold fungible, but I don't I don't think fungibility is a necessary. I mean, at the user level, a Bitcoin is a Bitcoin. At the code level, it's not. At the code level is much more complicated, right? But at the user level, a Bitcoin is a Bitcoin. As long as they don't start coloring them or doing what the EU wants to do, which is to trace them and say, well, that one's a money laundered Bitcoin, so you can't use that one anymore. And this is just typical Davos nonsense to try and get rid of, um, to try and de de to devalue Bitcoin and so they can write regulations to try and scare normies off of it, mm -hmm. and which is th their point. I mean, that's their that's their raison d'etre. They want central bank digital currencies and everybody on, a, on an open distributed ledger block uh distributed ledger they don't even really want a blockchain they just want a distributed ledger mm -hmm. you know encrypt the database that they control so that they can you know get 100 tax collection and have you know pure surveillance bitcoin i mean i like again i don't think necessarily that um bitcoin has to be fungible in at the code level in order to be digital gold um it just has to be it has to function that way at the user experience level um and uh i don't and think I, it has to be that why um what's your reason for that just I mean, is it does it because does it matter to the to the user why i mean i i'll ask you a question why does it need to be uh you know it, it becomes harder to use harder to use the, the 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 currency for its you know it becomes harder to use as a tool for sending value peer-to-peer -peer without censorship right if you can effectively uh, censor by blacklisting wallets. Black. Oh right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, right. I know. I, I get that. But you know. But again, that's easily dealt with by with coins like Monero. Mm -hmm. This is why I'm not a big Bitcoin maxi. It's why I don't think Bitcoin should do privacy. Like, oh, we we've got blacklisted Bitcoins. Fine, launder them through Pyre Chain, through Komodo Dex, or through Monero. Oh, they come out the other side, then swap them again for Bitcoin. Oh, done. Okay. Oops. Now they're my Bitcoins, and I can roll them all up into one UTXO, and we can start all over again. What? I right. I mean, isn't that the isn't that the isn't that ultimately where you know we we should I mean we can get around any any attempt by them to censor us. We can build a system or a competitor or a create a use case within crypto to to get around that. And so to me, like the whole idea of it's why privacy is so 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 unbelievably important. Mm -hmm. You know, because but again, I'm not saying that Bitcoin shouldn't try and do privacy. And I know I've talked to many a, a guy, you know, a hardcore Bitcoin guy who said, well, you know, like well, you can do privacy within Bitcoin as long as you make your transactions like this. And, you know, we got it. OK, fine. But how are you going to get that? How are you going to get adoption beyond beyond the 20 phone freakers in this in, in this tent? This was at Bitcoin 2021 last year. Mm -hmm. And he just kind of looked at me. I'm like, this is nice. I, I like your little cards and everything. It's all great. But how are you going to get, you know, your mom? Yeah, it's got it's got to, to be the fault. It's got to be you know. It's like, like it's like talking to the guys who said the, the internet never needed to get any more complicated than Usenet, right? Yeah, and Gopher, like okay, that's nice, and you know, all right, and they're still angry about you know Netscape, like okay, like 
whenever when you decide to come out of your basement, we're good. Like you know, or you decide to come out of your you know your your Linux server closet, you're good. Like I'm I'm okay. But for for reality and for across the 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 entire space, hold on for just a second. Um, I think that uh, it's 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 you know. Do you do you think music. do you think Bitcoin's so uh, fungibility aside? Do you think its mm. transparency creates uh, an attack surface? For governments, corporations, of course, to reach on for po potential. Of course, it does. Of course, it does. But I. But again, it's with infinite, with an infinite number of of potential account numbers, and the and the existence of other coins that can move them around, and create, you know, and create that and break the chain and break chain of custody. It's like everything else. I used to work as a chemist, right? And my my background is I'm a 25 years bench and research chemist, and you know, I know all, I I learned more about you know, chain of custody, legal chain of custody when dealing with the water samples um, to know that, you know, once you break chain of custody in any way, manner, shape or form, you've lost legal chain of custody. Well, it's the same thing. It's the same thing in chain analysis. You all you have to do is break the chain once. And what you then want, it's like, this is why I get angry with the Bitcoin maxis. I'm like, you want Monero to succeed. You want Monero to succeed because Monero's privacy, which will get, grant you back anonymity to all the normies within the crypto space, the bigger, this, you know, we all know this within, you know, within the privacy space, which is that the bigger the seed pool, the bigger the transaction pool, the, 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 to, to, to mix everybody's uh, account numbers, the bigger that is, the more privacy you get. The privacy, you know, the, the, the ability to back, uh, rever reverse engineer the inputs the, from the outputs goes, you know, dry, you know, goes that, that drops dramatically with a larger pool. Right. Which is one of the reasons why I really like the way Decred, for example, handles this. It's opt in privacy. But everybody who um, partakes of the proof of stake system to stake their Decred to become stakeholders in the DAO can mix their coins with everybody else's. They just use simple coin mixing, which isn't a particularly great version of of uh, of, of, um, of, of privacy. But they're going to have thousands of accounts right, available to constantly being mixed so that the entire float of Decred is pretty much mixed all the time. And so the ability to, for any authority to trace back whose account is, you know, which transaction with the whose account makes it impossible for them to legally go back and say, you owe us this amount of money in back taxes or you were involved in this transaction. And that's the, so this is why, I don't understand why why my maxis have to become so freaking religious about this. It's actually to their advantage to have coins that do things better than Bitcoin, because yeah. then it creates an ecosystem of use cases amongst all of these good proof of proof of work style coins, where everybody's kind of purpose built to do different things, and everybody has a place in the marketplace, and then they each wind up backing each other up, so that if the powers that be come and destroy Bitcoin, the Bitcoin's pro value proposition through the creation of paper Bitcoins and futures markets the same way that they've destroyed gold. Well, everybody can go, you know, that's nice, but we're all going to move to Monero now. We're all going to move to this thing. We're all going to move to that one. Mm -hmm. And it, all, it mean, all that has to happen is that, you know, it, we can just move away from it. And it, like, this is the point. And then, so yeah, the, and then the, the, the system, our ability to evade their control stays intact. And that's what we want to that's what we're ultimately, or what our ultimate goal here is, is here. And so you want those things available. You want those alternatives. You want blockchains like Monero and Decred. And, uh, pick one, uh, Pirate Chain, Digibyte, whatever. It doesn't matter. All these proof of work blockchains with different ideas behind, with different particular things that they want to do well, Dash, whatever. Like they do those things and they're there as backups and to constantly push Bitcoin to become better. From a technology standpoint, and if they and if Bitcoin can't evolve and become better from a technology standpoint, then they should grab market share over time, mm -hmm. and we'll know when we'll know the limit at which Bitcoin's technical advancement slows down, and you know it's just not worth it to the, the Bitcoin community to take on that particular corner of the monetary market. What do you see? Funny. As the the space looking like in the future, is it going to converge on a few protocols that do a few different things well, a few different niches? I think so. I think I th and I've always like I've, I wrote an article back in 2017 during the last Bitcoin run up about 
just before the peak, you know, when they, when, when the, when the, the SEC approved the first um, paper settled cash settled Bitcoin futures, which then marked the top three weeks later. And then, but I wrote an article a couple month, a couple weeks before that called the, like the, uh, I don't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but it's the first time I actually like threw up an idea for what extras pyramid would look like in a crypto world. It was a very like early idea about this. You know what extras pyramid is, right? John uh, extras uh, 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 inverse okay. pyramid of the monetary system, right? So yeah. extras pyramid is an inverse, an inverse pyramid. Mm -hmm. So imagine, you yeah. know, a pyramid on its peak. Yep. Where at the, the first layer is gold, which is very small. And then the next layer is, you know, M1 or M0 dollars. And then the next layer of that is treasury bonds. And the next layer above that is stocks and commodities. The next layer above that is, you know, uh, is credit derivatives or whatever. And that's X, John Exter's way of, of modeling the, uh, the monetary system as a function of the volume of each of those layers. And, but everything rests on a, pile, a very small pile of gold. Well, if you think of Bitcoin as the reserve asset of a crypto world, and then your next layer coins that actually do like the medium, the ones that are optimized for mediums of exchange, Bitcoin's not optimized to be a medium of exchange. Nat naturally, we have to use Lightning Network to even approximate it being becoming a decent medium of exchange. Um, then you have coins with better um, with better characteristics for that. Digibyte is a perfect example of a you know, 15 second block times, like huge block sizes. They can move like unbelievable amounts of money if you wanted to in no time flat. You could literally stand there at the at the counter, right? With a 15 second block time, you don't even need anything other than the Digibyte blockchain. I'm not, this is not an advertisement for the Digibyte, just an idea that you can, I can walk into my local cigar, I walk into my local liquor store and buy four cigars and a bottle of whiskey. And while I'm in the same amount of time, it takes the guy to run, you know, my credit card through the network and get an approval. I could actually validate an entire block. Right. And it's because of 15 second block time. So, I mean, if you're not willing to wait 15 seconds at the counter to validate your transaction, but it's like settled, it's done. It's not a T plus three settlement or clawbacks or anything else. It's done. It's out the door. Yeah. This is final. I think it's brilliant. You know, it, or, you know, so the second layer would be those coins. The ones above that would be the platform coins like, or the the platform tokens like Ethereum, now Avalanche and Solana and all these other ones that are that are to build all the uh, the financial products, the, that layer, platforms for either um, deploying new blockchains or things like that. And then we start getting into credit derivatives and yeah, all the rest yeah, yeah. of it. And so that that would be the, the that would be the model. But you start with Bitcoin at the bottom, which is you know the rock stupid. I mean, I mean this. I mean this with all respect to the Bitcoin maxis in the audience. Rock stupid, dumb technology, expensive to move coins around, blah blah. You know all of that. And this is actually to Bitcoin's advantage because, like gold, you don't want your reserve asset constantly moving all over the place. Yeah, you I want mean, it I, like you want it not moving around and stock to flow ratio staying very high. Yeah, and move yeah. the other stuff around. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, then I, use that as a unit of account in the store of value. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, the thing with me is that I always kind of can. I obviously all roads lead to Monero for me, right? So <laughs> it, the, the, <laughs> most the most important aspect of of all this stuff in in my mind has always mm -hmm. been, and from the few videos I've heard you make, I would think you would probably tend to agree with this notion: is the 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 you know the the protocol or the system that's that's least uh, apt to being co opted by by any outside power. Right, and then that yeah. would become the reserve in my mind, or the thing that 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 outlasts and outlives the you know the rest is the one that really just can't be controlled by any by any entity. I, I I'm okay with that too. Again, I'm not I'm not here to to argue for any one versus the other, and mm -hmm. I'm smart enough to realize that I don't know the answer to what's going to win because right. I don't know what the technology i don't know what technology we're going to demand in the future one of the arguments that I, I made on a on a bitcoin podcast recently as i said look um i'm not a bitcoin maxi for what I, for the reasons i've already stated and one more which is bitcoin today most bitcoin maximalist arguments are based on how bitcoin is going to compare versus the dollar how it's going to unseat the dollar I'm looking farther ahead than that. I'm looking to where Bitcoin's already beaten the dollar, which is a given. 
And then what's it going to look like when it actually gets a chance to compete against other blockchains? Right. right now, we're all comparing Bitcoin versus we're thinking in terms of Bitcoin as the tool for the job to, des to destroy the central banks and to destroy the fiat debt-based monetary system and the potential central bank digital currency unmoored from all opportunity cost digital script that they have planned for us. We need to beat that. Bitcoin will have no problem beating that. The dumber Bitcoin is, the slower and more stupid and uh, and more technologically um, backwards Bitcoin is. This is what I said to John Seth like two years ago. The better that is at that job, the more advantageous it actually is to being capable of doing that job. Because you're not going to want to just use your Bitcoin to go buy, a, you know, a pack of gum or, you know, a Diet Coke. Why would you want to do that? Maybe you want to tip your favorite podcaster, okay, because that is value for value. But do you really want to transact for food and daily services and Bitcoin when you've got dollars that you can spend? But spend the, it's Gresham's law. Spend the bad money, spend the overvalued money, the dollar, save and hoard the undervalued money. That's why gold doesn't circulate. So I, that's why nobody you know ever would offer that likes gold, would ever offer it to go buy a car with or anything else. Why would you do that? You're taking an appreciating asset and trading it for a depreciating asset. That's dumb. Give depreciating dollars. Take out a loan at 4% for your, to buy a car. Better off. You know, all you're doing is losing depreciating dollars. You don't care. That's the that's the trade-off. They need to depreciate those dollars in order to keep them circulating in order to satisfy the quantity theory of money and to satisfy their own poorly thought out arguments of Keynesian aggregate demand. Great. We are standing over here going, that's nice, but we're going to take value that's been tokenized, tokenized energy. We're going to take that money and we're going to store it and sit it over here in the corner and, and wait you all out until your Ponzi scheme implodes. The more attributes that particular thing has that makes it harder for you to move that money or that value, the less you're going to be willing to move it. Like the government, for example, has made it hard to move gold. And make money in gold, right? You buy physical gold, you lose 10% on the trade before you've even like finished giving the given Atmex your credit card. Why? Because you paid five percent, three to five percent over spot, and he'll buy it back for you for three to five percent under spot. So you've lost between six and ten percent before you even started. God forbid you make any capital gains. Then you got to pay, you know, 28% capital gains on what you on what you earned. So you're already starting by if you buy a, a, a gold eagle for two thousand dollars an ounce. You already realize that you're going to be selling it back to them for eighteen fifty, at best. So you've already lost one hundred fifty bucks an ounce. So you got to hope that it goes to twenty one fifty before you can even get back your two thousand bucks, right? But that actually is what keeps gold from circulating. Mm -hmm. And then what mm -hmm. they don't realize is that by doing by by doing that and then lopping taxes on top of it, Event. they're actually encouraging gold to sit and have the stock to flow ratio of gold stay high. Mm -hmm. Right, they're doing it in order to keep their system from collapsing, and all they're doing is feeding the beast, which yeah. is they're feeding the the uh, the the reserve the reserve assets that's going to beat them in the long run. And all that it takes is for one really disagreeable Russian to turn around and say, you know what, we're tying the ruble to gold. Mm -hmm. Now, and so now we can see and we can see what's happening. Now we can see how that's that's playing out in real time. Yeah, so. yeah, I want. I want I want to I want to ask you about that. Uh, just sure. hold that thought for a second. Sure. So do you so do you think Satoshi kind of saw Bitcoin as digital gold from day one, or because you know it was it, it was the way he right? that's the way he wrote it in the white paper. system. Well, he didn't really describe it. As, it was more of a digital cash, right? It was, it was yeah, but he did real he did make the argument. Go read the the white. I don't know when's the last time you read the white paper, but the last I time I read it, only, only I mean, it's been a while. I mean, I read it though, I read it recently, and I was like, no, he's talking about he's talking about analogous to gold mining. Uh, we are going to mine these. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're we're creating a system here that's analogous to gold mining. And so he wanted, and that's why we call it mining Bitcoin or mining Monero or whatever. It, it it comes from that. It comes from those early days of of that. I think it comes directly from the white paper. And if I'm I'm wrong about that, then yeah, I don't think he ever. Wrong. Maybe 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 I'm wrong. Maybe I maybe, think it, I think it is in ever, uh, I think it's in the abstract gold or in the or in the introduction. It's in, in the you know it's not a particularly long yeah uh, paper. Only and like, it reads like it reads like a, and I'll be honest with you, it's funny. It reads like a sophomore, um, you know, 
economics treatise from the Mises Institute. It's, it's <laughs> hilarious, to be honest with you, because I've read, lot, I've read, hundreds, lot, I've read of hundreds of those from the uh, quarterly the journal of quarter, quarterly libertarian studies and whatnot. Mm. I've read all that stuff. So. Yeah. Um, well, because I guess what I was, get, was I getting at, because I feel like the digital gold thing really came from like Barry Silbert and a couple of like who like really when, when Bitcoin was starting to, 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 to chug along, but didn't have the ability to act as digital cash, it, it right. kind of pivoted into being digital gold. Uh, and for all those who are saying like, oh, well, actually, we don't want to move it around. Why would you well, want to move your gold around? We just want it to, you know, to well, hop. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, the market is, I think the market has done that. I think yeah. you're right that I think the market has done that and seen what it can do. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that what he initially, you know, talked about, obviously the goal was you never thought that whoever thought that Bitcoins would be trading at 40 grand, 40,000 a piece and that, you know, moving that and that transaction costs of you know ten thousand a thousand satoshi or 10, five thousand satoshi would be like real money mm -hmm. that would you know like we never thought of that right yeah when you know when five when when bitcoins were trading i first traded them on mount gox at 5.5 cents okay i i wrote the art the my initial article for lou rockwell dated Jan july 10th 2010. oh wow okay oh yeah yeah, yeah. i mean i was there at the like i was there at the beginning i should own my own private island they all got stolen off of mount gox I had 200 bitcoins. They all got stolen off Mount Gox. Um, it wasn't because of the Mount Gox implosion. I got a key. My wife used my computer once, got a key logger, and the guy got into my my Mount Gox account and, and grabbed them in like 2012 or something like that. When I was trading about two two dollars, two twenty a piece, I probably would have sold them all at hundred dollars anyway. Going, these things are not yeah. worth hundred dollars. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you know, come on. I mean, but I already and the, the funny part about me is that I already had uh, I already had kind of all the alternative currency on we because i was in with the liberty dollar and all this other stuff mm -hmm. well before that so i already understood what the market needed so to me it immediately screamed oh this is just gold mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like i got it from the moment but i'm like but you know is it really becoming anything interesting uh, i don't know like is it you know is it really getting is it getting out of its ghetto where it actually can get to adoption and i just you know never really I didn't believe in Bitcoin until probably 2017. Mm -hmm. I'll be honest with you. And I had, but I had people asking me about it all through 2013, 2014. 2015. So what, what, what changed just that you saw the inertia? Just when I finally, somebody finally explained it to me what was happening and finally explained the network effect and you know, a couple of things that I just missed, like mm -hmm. really basic. You no, know, now when you think about it, it's like really basic stuff that I had, I had thought it through. I'd have bought 75,000 of the damn things and stuck them on a, you know, and suck them on a paper wallet somewhere. And, you know, that was yeah, so what was the disconnect? I mean, you were super early. You had Liberty Dollar or whatever the Liberty Gold, I forget what the thing was called. You had that but, before Bitcoin even existed. So you, you saw this need for uh, a digital cash. I just didn't believe it. You just I didn't believe it. it was going anywhere. I would yeah. check in with it every few months and all I saw was the same thing. Mm. I saw the same stuff over and over and over again. I saw no real adoption in the real world. I saw no real, I saw, I saw it not breaking out of the same ghetto that all the other ones were in. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I just didn't, you know, it just, it didn't break and become something big. And I was still, and I was a little bitter. I got, you know, 200 Bitcoin stolen, you know, for nothing. So I, I get hard to, you know, like took my eye off the ball, was working on other things. It is what it is. And, you know, it's an interesting Raul Powell last year um, was going through this. He had a very famous video of his one around where he was talking about, you know, his relationship to Bitcoin. And I'm listening to it going, yeah, I've been there. Yep. That was me. Yep, I just sold him too early. Yep, I got angry with it. Yeah, yeah, that, like that's me. Like I, I, I know what it looks like, and yeah. you know. So today, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, obviously, and but every time it would get get on, it would get a little farther along. I'm like, cool, it's not going anywhere, but cool. It's still interesting magic beans. Cool, um, like, but now I get it, and it took a long time to get over that. Um, yeah. And now that I'm there, I'm like, now it's now I immediately became interested in what other coins could, what other use cases within the, the space and what crypto should look like or what I think crypto could or could not look like. And this yeah. is where I think, it, Rick, you know, we can get into security architectures and, you know, audit blocks and all this stuff. And I'm like, I don't know why anybody uses one monolithic blockchain. I think it's dumb. Mm -hmm. I think I think you all should be sending audit blocks to each other and validating each other's proof of work. I think Monero should send an audit block like Komodo used to to the Bitcoin blockchain. Why? So that 
if anybody does, if, so if George Soros gets a bug up his ass and says, "Hey, I'm going to spend twelve billion dollars and I'm going to I'm going to buy the Monero blockchain," um, he can't because all he can do is roll it back an hour. Right? I mean, that's the best you can. I mean, if somebody is because there comes a point where somebody could just do something dumb with all of their fiat bucks and just and just bomb the bomb some of the smaller blockchains. And I think that there's a certain level, like, you know, why wouldn't you want to buy some insurance protection yeah, against your blockchain? Yeah. I, I mean, it just makes sense to me. Like, yeah, that's like roll up a roll up an hour's worth of the last transactions box and hash them together, stick them on the, the Bitcoin blockchain. Now they got to hack both of you. Mm-hmm. I mean, when Komodo came out with that back in 2016, I was like, this is everything you need to know. Mm-hmm. Like, because that, because now as opposed to having to um, attract miners away from Bitcoin. Now you can security mule the foundation asset, the reserve asset, and then build your medium of exchange asset or your privacy asset or your this asset or your NFT platform, whatever it is. But you've already tied it, the security mule of the foundation. And now the whole ecosystem is made stronger by this. Mm-hmm. And less capable of external non-economic attack. Because we've only just begun to fight the regulators here. We've only just begun to fight these evil people. They are aware of us now. They were aware of us a while ago. Almost almost convinced that Ethereum is a Trojan horse. I'm like, I'm I'm almost with the Ripple guys on this. Not that I think Ripple is anything other than a Trojan horse in and of itself, but that's a different story for a different day. Um, but like to me, this is just like I can see, you know, what they're what they're doing and what they're trying to do. Being a, a veteran of the gold wars and seeing how they how they trade how they treat gold and silver, and they're treating Bitcoin the same way. Mm-hmm. They're creating now they're creating competitors and backing competitors and trying to get people you know playing the the the, the digital casino with you know. Proof of stake, DGen on you know on, on some of these on Ethereum and you know Avalanche and all these other these other interoperable this interoperable blockchain. It's like you know some of that stuff's cool, but like not without a good strong foundation. And that strong foundation has to be again. I go back to I'm a proof of work maxi, and let the best coin win or so, coins win. Do you so do you think Bitcoin obviously is already coming under a lot of attack for being proof of mm-hmm. work? Um, do you think a lot of headway is going to be made there in terms of governments? You know, I think gov- I think governments are going to try and virtue signal all they want about this. They're going to try and ESG Bitcoin out of existence. And what Guess what? Going to happen? Yeah. I think that I think none of that really matters because this is where, you know, like, Michael Saylor made the perfect point, which is a point we all already knew, which is that thirty percent of all electricity that we generate goes to ground. Because in order to keep the electricity um, uh, lines pressurized with voltage, you got to, you know, whatever's not demanded has to go to ground all the time. And then we just siphon off what we need. Bitcoin today uses one quarter of 1% of that electricity we send to ground. Mm -hmm. So Bitcoin actually is recovering wasted energy that we've already spent. Right. So Mm -hmm. add the rest of the proof of work block chains together and i don't even think they you know are equivalent of one tenth of the bitcoin blockchain in terms of hashing power right so electricity generation so what is that you know 0.3 percent of 30 percent of what we waste Mm -hmm. and the administration of any kind of crypto um monetary system since it doesn't need big buildings and it doesn't need huge server farms and it doesn't need this and it doesn't need that we already have layered the cost into the generation of the new coins and the maintenance of the blockchain itself, 90% of the cogs for running the network are already paid for, right? Maybe another 10% for lightning and some other thing, you know, some other people getting back and forth to, you know, put gas in their car to go make sure their ser- the servers are running and, and and small office buildings full of ant, you know, ant, ant miners and all the rest of it. But most of it's already paid for. Mm-hmm. I don't need to have big offices. I don't need to have, um, I, I don't need to put out promotional materials. I don't need to beat the streets. I don't need to then create hot dog vendor. I don't need to have all the infrastructure necessary of a city to run wall street, 
which runs, which consumes orders of magnitude more energy per dollar transaction, per dollar per transaction. Equivalent. Yeah, but the whole argument is just is it's just dumb. Um, it, it's just dumb. It, it's it's meant to gaslight dumb millennials. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to be fortunately blunt. it works though i mean so, so once again so that's why I, I run into the issue with big I, I think it has you know attack surfaces so it's it's lack of mm -hmm. privacy is one and then i also think it's it's tendency to be mined by asics uh yeah. it's, it's just one. large mining companies that can be approached and co-opted and influenced by sure. by governments i agree no i'm not gonna not i'm not gonna lie that i don't think that they're again these this is why multi-protocol coins are interesting right and this is why i you know i i i agree with all this stuff I, but like i think those arguments are very valid i just don't think that they're important right now mm -hmm. i think the bigger fight is are you going to survive the next time the governments try to you know get rid of you are you going to are you going to survive that one i know that we are <laughs> I mean, because I'm not dumb, I can do math, and I know that they can't take Bitcoin down. And if they could take Bitcoin down, they already would have done so. Mm -hmm. If there was a back, if there was an NSA backdoor into SHA-256, we have a bigger problem than whether or not the Bitcoin blockchain can be hacked, because the entire internet runs on SHA-256. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, everybody's encrypted database is based on SHA-256. So, like, you know, is there any privacy anywhere? So. I, I, you know, I'm not against any of these arguments about why, again, why I'm not a Bitcoin maxi is, you know, what I keep saying. And I, I don't, and I don't mean that I, I don't want Bitcoin to win or I want, I do want Monero to win or I don't want this. I don't care. Yeah, I'm you're agnostic being about open minded. Yeah, you're, you're, I'm completely you're, agnostic. You're a scientist. I want, you're a chemist, right? You're, you're, you're taking this, yeah. the scientific method, which uh, I'm you, just, yeah. well, yeah, I mean, well, it's not even that. It's like, it's, it's, it's a matter of, you know, I look at, yeah, I am a chemist. So I, I tend to look at everything as the Gibbs free energy equation and I can't, can't help myself. And I'm doing the Delta G equals, you know, Delta H minus C Delta S going, someone's going to be more spontaneous than the other at this point moment in time. And this is what's, this is what's going to take market share, which, which one is it? But again, I'm just agnostic about it. I, I I think it's all I think it's all good. I think you should own a smattering of all of these things. Mm -hmm. And you can, you know, and every and anybody, you know, and any Bitcoin maxi in the audience that says it's dumb to, to like own Monero, I, they're making the same arguments. Well, they're just trying to dilute the the purity of Bitcoin demand. I'm like, yeah, so you're making the same argument that guys like Jay Dyer make, like conservatives like Jay Dyer make about libertarians that we were created out of whole cloth by the CIA in order to dilute real national conservatism. Oh, okay. Yeah. And the federal reserve were all a bunch of closet Austrians and not, they're not actually not Keynesians either. Right. right. Oh, okay. Okay. Boomer. You have, a nice, <laughs> you have a nice day. You're insane. And I, and I mean that, I mean, I get this all the time. I get people ask me, why don't you have this guy on your show? Why don't you have that guy on your show? Cause I don't want to have an argument with someone. I don't want to bring somebody on their show to argue with them on my podcast. Like I don't bring people on my podcast that I'm going to be hostile to because they're going to come out and they're going to say something really hostile. And then I'm going to have to like destroy them or I'm going to have to like get into a, a going to get into a shouting match with them. Like, I'm not going to do this. I'll have a respectful conversation about things we might or might not agree with, but I, I'm not going to go that route. You start telling me that Bitcoin, that, that libertarians were created by the CIA in the 1940s to, you know, as a way to push people towards communism. And I'll look at you and go, you're just an idiot. And I'm, you know, we're done now. Like, I'm not even going to have that conversation. This is dumb. Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans. And if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, gratuitous and Monero. How, it's like, how, you know, how how deep and dark do you think things go? I mean, I like I said, I haven't heard much of your stuff, but like, what what's kind of your overall, um, you know, elevator pitch, quick take on on the world? Like, who, who's who's running the world? You oh know? well, I, I I call it the Davos crowd. Okay, right? and Davos is a mixture of old European money, neo-colonial old European money, you know, from the British crown to the Dutch bankers to the Rothschilds and all those guys, all that old money centered around the world economic forum, Klaus Schwab and those guys, some nouveau riche European and American money like George Soros. George Soros is a first generation made man. Uh, and then your, your second and third generation 
uh, American um, and British, uh, you know, effectively. And from these people's perspective, nouveau riche, they're only, they're, they're only third generation money or fourth generation money, you know, compared to the Europeans that are, you know, 15, 20, 30 generation money, right? The, a mixture of those, British deep state assets, American deep state assets, American neoconservatives, they own, they think they run the world. They get together at Davos every year, eat chocolate, drink Swiss coffee and, and decide and, and sniff each other's farts and decide what, you know, how we're going to move the world, how we're going to run the world. And we'll, we'll, we'll bribe that guy and we'll get compromise on that guy. And we're going to, we have these really idiotic ideas. I was talking to a guy this morning um, about this. He's like, I've been to Davos. I've hang out, hung out with those people. I, I raise money on the sidelines of Davos because it's more because they're all they're all crazy and full of, and full of shit. But I go to the bars afterwards and I'm like, you know, raising money with with these guys and you know talking about real business while they're just like over there sniffing their own farts and thinking that they've got like these grandiose ideas of how they're going to change the world. The problem is is that they're cons- they they do have a lot of power and they do have a lot of money, and they've built systems that roll a tremendous amount of wealth up to them through the Cantillion effect of being able to print the money and get first access to it, mm-hmm. first mover access to it. And, but that system is failing. Bitcoin, Monero, gold, those are the countervailing assets to that. And, um, but you think they have a handle on that too? Like we said with the, the ability to co-op? No, really. Bitcoin? No, no, I think, I think, I think the forces of decentralization are just stronger than the forces of centralization. I always believe that I am a libertarian. Ultimately, I'm an anarcho libertarian, like, yeah, yeah, like yeah, hardcore yeah. Too, Murray yeah. Rothbard is Murray Rothbard voted and he was wrong for doing like, uh, <laughs> I love Murray and I, I agree with strate- I agree with Murray at times with Murray's strategic bent. But just to give people an idea, like, yeah, I, I, I kind of disagree with Rothbard about strategic voting. I'm like, just don't vote. It doesn't it just encourages them. Um, like, what's the point? But I did vote for Trump twice because it was important at that moment in time to send a particular message. Mm-hmm where it would have maximal value, but in every other presidential election was the point. Like, um, we'll see what happens in 2024. Um, I'm no, I don't need to vote in this where I am in Florida. I know I don't need to vote in this month's in this year's midterms because you know, Mike, the Republicans gonna win. The Libertarian's not gonna win. So what's the point? Not that I would actually almost at this point want the Libertarian to win because that party is completely co-opted, even worse than the Florida GOP is. Um but no, I don't think they have a, a good handle on it. I think they have a lot of really grandiose ideas. They have a lot of political power. They have a lot of money. And they have and they ha- and they were at their most powerful when no one knew who, who they were. And they were influencing things behind the scenes. And only, and in the, in the age pre, in the internet age, pre-social media, where we can do stuff like this and have the kinds of communications. Mm-hmm. And then, thanks to now the golden age of podcasting, we have the ability to talk to each other in a way and communicate with each other in a way, which is ultimately already censorship proof in the first place. Yep. Yeah. They can throw us off of Twitter and yeah, they can throw us off of Facebook. So what? We can go start another podcast Yeah, and we can attract an audience that way. And, you know, like Apple is not really actively censoring our app, you know, podcast RSS feeds. And if they are fine, you drive, they drive you underground, but how far do they drive you underground? What's driven underground today is an audience that's still 20 times bigger than, than the audiences we were commanding 15, 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you can find 50,000 people to follow your podcast, like now 20,000 people, like getting an audience of 20,000 people in 2000 was like, Oh my God, you know, how can I, I could rule the world with this right mm-hmm. today. Like 20, you know, a podcast is only does, it does 10, 12,000 hits. Isn't it's kind of, Kind of eh, cool. Oh mm-hmm. wow, you have fifteen thousand people following you on Twitter. Really? Is that all? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like so th- the ability for us to get information and disseminate that through the big distributed yeah. neural network of of people. Um, you know, it just takes time, energy, and effort. And as long as you stay consistent with your message, you'll get there. That's why you and I are talking today. So do you do you think there's going to be some there is going to be some struggle though? Obviously, they're going to oh yeah 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 it's going to be awful. Bank digital currency. It's going to be awful. It's going to be, it's gonna be World War Three, Doug. It's going to be World War Three. They're 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 goading the Russians into trying to start a nuclear war. For what's what's the strategy there? What's the purpose? Well, the purpose is they they want to be able to they want to be just they want to destroy the old system. The old system is falling. Right, the old monetary system is failing. Their goal is to kill a lot of people because they're all, in their minds, useless eaters anyway that they can't afford to feed. 
their old system is failing and they really do need to crash the old one, kill as many people as possible. And so that they can retain power. This is their means by which they think that they can crash the old system, go through a spasm, just like they did in World War II, but they actually still remain in power. When World you say, War II was the last one of these. They, and the same people, and the same people who were behind and financed Hitler and the Soviet Union and World War One and World War II are the same people we're fighting today. Mm -hmm. They've just morphed into they're just they've morphed into now climate change, Malthusian and ninnies. Same thing, same problem. The problem is, is that, and, and then the end of World War II brought us a deflationary shock brought on by the uh, the returning of the United States with the, to the world to a $35 per ounce gold peg. Just like after World War I, the Brits went back and, and pegged the pound sterling to $20, which is what it was. You know, or whatever they pegged the pound sterling to the pre-war price, which caused a massive deflationary collapse within within uh, the UK, which eventually caused a sovereign debt default all across Europe, which led to World War II. World War II was predicated was predicated not on poor monetary policy on the part of the Fed. Schwartz and Friedman were wrong about this. Anna Schwartz and Milton Friedman were completely wrong about this. It was a sovereign debt default in Europe, across Europe in 1931, which sent all the capital in Europe into, into the United States and caused, and caused a deflationary depression across Europe, which then, of course, allowed for the rise of Hitler because, you know, reparate, war reparations, of course, of World War One were killing the German economy. And so the Germans went through their hyperinflation in 1929. The, um, the sovereign debt default in 1931 left Europe a mess. All the capital fleed into the United States. That money paid for the U.S. war machine and paid for the German war machine. A lot of that money wound up paying for the German war machine because the Germans borrowed a tremendous amount of money from, you know, Papa, from Prescott Bush and all the rest of them. So, like... The goal then was to send was to create Hitler and throw him at Stalin to kill the Soviet Union. It failed, and then they brought the Americans and the Brits in to clean up the mess. They called, brought the Americans in to clean up the British and the French's mess. But so, that's what in, happened. In, in terms of today, like, like, like where's Putin in this mess? Why? Why is Putin he, is, why is, is he not part of the inner circle? Why is he uh, off? Because he refuses to ruble with gold. What's going on there? Because he refuses. Because he's a because he's a Russian nationalist. In the same way that Trump was an American nationalist, Nigel Farage is a British nationalist, and Viktor Orban is a Hungarian nationalist. Putin was brought in by Boris Yeltsin. Martin Armstrong has made this abundantly clear. Go, 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 go peek in the Martin's back catalog. He'll explain the story because he was right there. That the IMF and and Edmund Safra and, and the Bank of New York Mellon and, and the IMF were setting Yeltsin up for to steal $15 billion of IMF money. And Yeltsin finally, or seven or fifteen billion, some some amount of money. And Yeltsin finally realized what was happening, and was going to get set up for stealing this money that he had, that the Russians had never even gotten. Well, guess what? The same thing's going to happen in Ukraine. By the way, all this money that we're going to send them is never going to get there. Putin, Yeltsin defers to Putin, hands Putin power, in order to stop the the the, the final takeover of Russia. And. You know, at the time, I don't think our people really and, and the Brits really understood who Putin was. They figured he would be somebody they would be able to control. Turns out he was not capable of being controlled at all. It's when he, you know, went after Bill Browder. He, you know, jailed Kordakovsky, nationalized Yukos, and the rest of the history. And, and the rest of it goes from there. And then we get into, you know, the Munich Security Conference in 2007, you know, Georgia and South Ossetia in 2008, blah, blah, blah. And then it's just all since then. Putin has been assiduously trying to rebuild Russia to be fortress Russia to knowing full well that at some point the West was going to declare war on Russia. It's why they had $630 billion worth of foreign exchange assets. It's why their sovereign wealth fund had over 200 billion or $300 billion. They have a trillion dollars in savings for an economy that's nominally $1.7 trillion with a, with a net debt, total net debt exposure ruble or foreign currency related of less than $450 billion. So they have the strongest balance sheet in the world. Yeah, they don't necessarily have the most thriving of industrial bases and we're wide, widely uh, understood industrial bases. Fine. That's phase two. Phase one is get through the war. Build up for the big war that the, that because when the Russians finally say that's enough and we're not backing down any further, 
which is, you know, the Donbass in Eastern Ukraine, that's going to cost some money. That's going to cost some prestige. It's going to cost us relationships. It's going to cost us a whole lot. But we're going to back the ruble with gold and we're going to break these people because we're never, because Russia will never be safe until these people are broken. How do you, how do you see that playing out? Black back. So this is just as a new development, right? Is this really happening? Are they really back in the ruble with gold? You think yeah. it's Well, they, they've already, the bank of Russia has already issued that they, they're running a little bit of a float at this point because they never, I don't think they expected it to be as successful as it was. And they're bringing the ruble back down into from the stratosphere, but the ruble today closed at like 65 to the dollar. Ruble hasn't been 65 to the dollar since pre COVID. Now, of course the ruble should be trading in the thirties with their trade balance, but let's not talk about that. Like this is where we get into like the really crazy stuff. Uh, I have to get all, I have to like take off my crypto hat and put on my, my hardcore market analyst hat. Go ahead, put it on. Well, yeah, I only have 12 minutes on. Okay. Um, this is the problem. So, and I don't think I can even set this whole thing up in 12 minutes, but understand that by, by Putin and the Bank of Russia effectively tying the ruble to gold and thereby the gold to oil and gold to oil, the gold to the ruble, that the ruble is the intermediary. We now have a commodity. We now have the beginnings of a commodity based financial system, which is going to um, reassert itself, where those who produce something, the things we need to make the world run are no longer going to accept nothing, promises to pay, promissory notes, debt-based currencies, or script for the currency, which is why the ruble is strengthening the way it is, because guess what? The Americans and the Europeans are still buying Russian energy. They're just not saying it out loud. With multiple reports out there that were through back doors and third-party intermediaries and everything else, and that means... They got to go get rubles off of the Moscow exchange and convert them to Gazprom Bank, who's now charging them the FX cost, the Forex cost, as opposed to the Russians previously having to eat the Forex cost. They take in euros, what they convert what they need to rubles by paying the, the foreign exchange rate, um, conversion rate on that, to, taking the hit. They're now transferring that cost back onto Europe and the United States and everybody else. And that's not an insignificant amount of money. You know, you change money, it's, you know, it's four to 8%. And in a scenario where the Russian ruble can't be, you know, effectively can't be printed fast enough by the Bank of Russia under the scenario, if the Russians can't sell sovereign debt to anybody because they're not allowed to, they're not allowed to, no one's allowed to buy it. Well, the Chinese are allowed to buy it. The Turks are allowed to buy it. The Iranians are allowed to buy it. The Indians are buying it. Um, that means that the ruble has to strengthen dra dramatically if the balance of payments has to continue. And the other thing this is all done is it's, and this is where the Monero guys in the audience will be very happy because what we've done by putting sanctions, by one, seizing the foreign exchange assets of a G7 country, a G8 country, and um, putting on un the kinds of sanctions they have and weaponize the SWIFT system, it makes the entire Western financial architecture really suspect because, well, if you don't do what we ask you to do, then we're going to cut you off and we're going to steal your money and we're going to be justified for doing so. Okay. That sounds good. Um, I'm not going to hold your shitty currency anymore. So Gazprom Bank is going to take in all these rubles or all these euros and all these dollars and all these yen and all this other stuff. And they're going to immediately turn them back out again. Do you think they're going to take the excess from that? And they're going to turn around and like buy European sovereign debt with it? With their trade surplus? Like the Russians run a trade surplus. The normal scenario would be they run a trade surplus, they get excess dollars, they get excess euros, and they turn them back into US Treasury bonds or they invest them back in US Treasury bonds or euros or whatever. Pre war, Zoltan Pozar over Credit Suisse put a great post about this. Said, look, look at the, uh, the foreign exchange reserves we just seized. 200 billion of those were sitting, were sitting in ruble dollars and euro swaps. Funding the offshore dollar, euro dollar markets, like they were a net positive contributor to very tight euro dollar markets, which has done what? You freeze that money; it's not there anymore. The offshore dollar markets have, are, have seized up. The euro dollar futures curve has crashed. The 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 euro is trading at a dollar five. The do, the dollar is going through the roof. The yen is getting crushed. The pound has lost seven cents. It's like, oh look, this is my nose. This is a knife. I'm going to cut that off because I think I look better this way. 
These people aren't, but they're doing it. But the thing is, Douglas is doing it on purpose because they actually want to, they think they can do demand destruction and crash the entire system and force the Russians to, and they think they're going to take the Russians down by forcing them to cut back to only 9 billion, 9 million barrels a day of oil production. Like they think that's going to like somehow tick the oligarchs in Russia off enough to overthrow Putin. Like they still don't get it. The oligarchs don't run Russia. Putin runs Russia. The Russian state is bigger than the Russian oligarchs. It's hard for Westerners to understand because we all know that the oligarchs run the West. Mm-hmm. That we're all that our governments are all regulatory captured by this, you know, this corporate right. autocracy, Dif- different ball, this technocratic tor- corporatocracy, and that it's all. But it doesn't really work that way in Russia and China, India, and others. These SOEs, these state-owned enterprises, are more powerful. Mm-hmm. And Alexei Miller, the CEO of Gazprom, knows full well that if he gets out of too far out of line, Putin has him sent to the gulag. And then they put another guy in his place. Or Igor Sechin over at Rosneft. I can't tell you the number of times I've watched Igor Sechin in the last five years open his mouth on Thursday and get it slapped back down on Friday. Okay? Sechin has no power whatsoever. But we here in the West think he does have power and that he can influence Putin. You cannot influence Putin. The Security Council runs Russia. The Duma actually has more power over Russia than these guys do. They are all subservient. I got part of that. I got to ask you because I know I know you don't have much time. So t- tying crypto into this, what do you think is Putin's kind of take on take on crypto? How is he going to use that? What what's well? He's already made Bitcoin or digital assets with the new like I know the the the, the Bitcoin's. Um, space, the crypto space, wasn't all that pleased with the Russian um, digital asset regulations that they put in place. They're far too restrictive. They're not really friendly, yada, 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 but they exist. Okay. And Bitcoin is not taxed like a commodity. There's no capital gains tax associated with using Bitcoin. So it's been legalized for the banking sector to hold Bitcoin and you and, and do exchanges with it. So it exists that way. The regulations allow for Bitcoin um, and digital asset um, companies to do business in Russia and to pay taxes and all the rest of it. As long as you're willing to pay the Russian government your taxes, you can have a Bitcoin mining rig company in Russia. And guess what? You have the lowest cost of production in the entire world because the Russians produce energy for like three cents a kilowatt hour. We can't compete with that here in the United States. Rosatom is the most powerful. Is, is the most powerful company in the world that you can't buy a share of, which is the Russian state atomic energy company. So does does Putin start backing the ruble with with crypto in addition to, to I don't know I don't know that he does that per se but I think just by having it there as a backup I, he's not going to say no to it building up as a as an asset within the Russian monetary system the Russian banking system as long as the as long as these people pay their taxes he doesn't give a damn will he pull it will he pull bitcoin into the into Russia's foreign exchange reserves or into its sovereign wealth fund I think it's too early to tell but I don't think he's averse to the idea. Okay. I, I, and I say that because he has, he's met with, with, with crypto enthusiasts. He's met with Buterin back in 2017, Vitalik Buterin of, of Ethereum. He's met with other people within the space. He personally understands that crypto is very, very powerful. And he understands the power of smart contracts and running elections, for example, on Ethereum or some version thereof. Like, because that way he can get around, he sees the value of that getting around the, you know, the OSCE um, trying to say, oh, well, those elections in Russia, they weren't valid. Well, we did them on a blockchain. Here are the results. They're publicly available. Here's the audit. Oh, 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 oh. And then they have the virtue signal, you know, at, at the, through the BBC and just, you know, bloviate and say, oh, well, we can't really trust that because it's Russian and it's a Russian blockchain. And who knows if it's like, like, okay, really? But here's the data and there's the GitHub and shut up. Like, like it's you know, but again, people will be, still just believe what they want to believe. But I think that Putin understands the value of these assets from a strategic perspective, and therefore, with a great amount of control, he will allow them their space within the Russian economy. And so, I don't see any. I don't. I don't see how that. I think that's the best we can hope for, and that should be at this point good enough. Because the path to quote unquote hyper Bitcoin it 
Bitcoinization or hyper cryptoization, you know, and that, that moment in the future where crypto beats everybody. We have a long way to go to get there. We're on like step C or D and we got to go to Z. There's a long way to go. We're in the first or second inning of this thing from, from this particular far. We're in game two. Game one was legitimacy, store value, right? We're at that stage now. Now we're in the game two of this three game set or, you know, best of five series. Game two is going to, is, is the fight now against the existing monetary structure. And I think, as I said at the outset, I think you actually want a coin like Bitcoin to, to make that fight, to be the, the, the vanguard to take that fight on because you want it as pure and undiluted from a, a code perspective as possible. And um, then leave it to end. It's already got first, first mover advantage and all the rest of it. While the other coins like Monero, like Decred and Pirate Chain and all the other like proof of work coins that I have a lot of, I have a lot of respect for and I really like, and I've mentioned multiple times now, you want their blockchains to mature. You want your ecosystems to mature. You want, you want trust to be built into their, the longer you exist, the more trust you, you, you gain. You you create like what as John says said to me to, to end this as John says said to me one day is like what's the most valuable thing about Bitcoin? The blockchain. Every block makes the Bitcoin blockchain more valuable. Every blockchain makes itself more valuable with every block that goes by the board. So every so during this thing we validated how many Monero blocks. Well. Monero is two that minutes. much more, yeah. that much stronger. I don't remember what the block time was on Monero. Two minutes. Yeah, like two it. minutes. So, so 30 blocks have gone by the board in the, the time we've been talking. And that's great. It's glorious. It's wonderful. It's fantastic. And the more transactions you can get across that blockchain, the more people you can, you know, just to, 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 to validate the, uh, the privacy system, to validate the, uh, to, to validate the, the, the blockchain and, and, and the multi, because now I understand correctly, Monero is multi protocol now, right? What do you mean? In terms of a multi-security protocol, or or um, you can mine it across with different, um, with different miners, right? Uh, well, it, it has a fix. It has a random. The proof of work is called RandomX. So basically, right. okay. So yeah, you guys moved over to a different one. You moved over to RandomX. Way right. to mine Monero is with the CPU, essentially. Right. Oh, okay. Um. Now there are other ones out there that are like you can mine them across with you know this. You can mine them on your phone with one protocol. You can mine them on, you know, with your computer on another. You can mine it on an oh, yeah. it's, it's, it's yeah. just random X across the board. Okay, it's just random X. I couldn't remember if, if Monero was moving to that or not. I know that they were, you guys were moving. I knew that Monero was moving to a different protocol or a different uh, security architecture for a reason. And, but I don't follow it that closely. I have to, you have to remember that a lot of this stuff for me exists here at the theoretic mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. I don't spend a lot of time down in the code because i'm not a coder and i don't really i'm a monetary theorist first and yeah geopolitical analyst second so no i hear but you. I, I love i you know again i love monero i think it's a i think it's a lovely thing to have in the marketplace and yeah, um, yeah i i'm 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 happy you do you know you sound you sound like you're uh you know you've you've been in this game for a while you're obviously a really intelligent guy uh you're really analytical so it's it's encouraging to see that you've uh, you're aware of Monero, found your way to Monero, and you, you see, uh, you know. Uh, I've known about Monero for an awfully long time, and I've written about Monero in the past, and uh, you know, and uh, I I know it's evolving, and and I and I like what I'm seeing with from a lot of these um, from a lot of these coins where they they're seeing, you know, where they had an idea originally what would their 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 raise on detro would be. Mm -hmm. And then they're realizing, well, that, that raise on debt is not necessarily great in the marketplace. It's not particularly competitive in the marketplace. Can we shift our rates? Can we shift that and make it more, make it better? Can mm -hmm. we, can we, can we, can we be nimble with smaller blockchains? You can do that still. Once you become the size of Bitcoin, moving Bitcoin is like trying to move an aircraft carrier and do it with a tugboat. Yep. Yep. No, Mon Monero yeah. stuck to its mission of digital cash, and I think it's done a really yeah. good job at, at at being that and continuing to evolve towards that. And every, right. every move it makes is is make is 
tending yeah, to be the hard true. the hard one is going to be scaling up to you know you guys all want value now here's the problem everybody wants their coin to like you know go to the moon and become really valuable and I, the, the question is is Monero going to be just as expensive at ten thousand dollars a coin as as bitcoin is and it's a real to transact yeah. well i mean the if the interesting thing i mean we didn't get into it on this show because i didn't right. want to I didn't want to badger you with so much Monero stuff, but I, I'm okay with it. I, you know, I'm here. To, you know, like we should do this again, so I can like I can like oh. learn more because I haven't. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah that's well, we, we could have you on our our Monero Topia show, which is a live show we do with the community, and I know that Monero they would Topia, love that's it. fucking hilarious. <laughs> they, they would love. We just had a conference in Miami, Monero Topia conference. Nice, nice. Yeah. I like that. Bitcoin, but yeah, basically, the point I was trying to make is uh, dynamic block size. So that's you know another right. distinctive fact distinguishes Monero from Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. uh, it's bl block sizes are, are dynamic. So actually, as as more people use Monero, as more transactions are put into blocks, the transaction fee goes down collectively, right? right. Uh, so the more people that use Monero, uh, the cheaper it becomes to, to send transactions. Then uh, that's a that's a yeah yeah a, that that's something I, I that's something I have to look I, I have to I have to to, to to look into to understand the 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 math as to why but that, that's fine like that's, yeah. this is this is this is the kind of thing you know you know you, you ultimately have to 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 assess as you move forward right mm -hmm. I'm looking at you know I look at other tokens and other systems and going okay like it's great I can move this thing around for a penny today but it's still a flat. 0.005 token cost. Well, when the token is trading for a dollar and a half, that's nothing. The yeah. token, token's trading for 1500 that's a lot of money. Yeah. No, don't get me wrong. Once the price goes up, obviously, yeah, you're paying whatever. Per, it's based on the size of the transaction, right? But um, the, you know, as more, the, the price isn't going to go up unless the transaction count goes up. And as transaction count goes <laughs> up, block sizes get bigger in Monero and mm -hmm. you're getting more transactions in each block and they can right. get larger and larger over time with more use. Right. So then you're paying uh, essentially less per transaction percent yeah. wise. Um, Cool, man. Thank, thank you so much for cool. for taking your for taking your time. Uh, where if you just want to let people know where they could learn more sure. about you. So I'm um, uh, the blog. I the the blog Gold Goats and Guns. Uh, you can find it my my blog is tomluongo.me or goldgoatsandguns.com. You can just look just look me up and you'll find it that way. Um, I also have a Patreon, which is where I take care of my people, and we publish a monthly uh, retail. Uh, investor level newsletter replete with a, a portfolio strategy. It has gold, it has cryptos, it has a variety of things in it um, that I think are interesting as a model portfolio for dealing with the intersection of geopolitics and markets and, you know, and, and really changes in the cultural zeitgeist. Um, so there's that, obviously the podcast, all that's linked on the blog. So it's all just one big repository. You go there and you can follow me on Twitter at TFL 1728, where I'm sure that if you say something dumb, I will um, be rude. Because that's my that's my that's my public persona uh, on Twitter. Because like I can't mo help like most people, on like there. everybody else, like it's you said, bad, dumb, you get both, you get both barrels because it's just more fun that way. What 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 else is Twitter for? Like it's like it's like Usenet 2.0. It's 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 awesome. awesome. <laughs> and it may even be a free speech zone again. Well, at least you know within within reasonable parameters. No more able to say you know something like ivermectin. It'll be you know without like invoking the wrath of the gods. So, I know we, we didn't even get into that. We didn't get the whole Elon want to go to. It's that's I'm so behind. I'm so beyond that at this point. Yeah. I don't even care. Um, that's how I got that's how I got through it by just ignoring it. Well, are are you going to be at Pork Fest? Because you seem like a Pork Fest type of guy. You're familiar with Pork Fest? I am, but I'm not going to be there. Okay. I'm, not a, I, I'm not an active member of the Libertarian Party anymore. I was between 2000 and 2004. I was nearly state chair in Florida. Uh, oh. I ran for state house in 2002. I was a member of the executive committee for three years. I came to the to the to the um, startling conclusion in 2004 that the Libertarian Party was one infiltrated by GOPers uh, to destroy it, and two was never going anywhere. And I immediately stopped. And then just gave my just gave a hundred dollars a month uh, split between Lou Rockwell and antiwar.com. And I consider that money far well spent, far better spent. Awesome, awesome, yeah. Because I was saying maybe, maybe we'd see you up there because uh, it seemed like no, yeah, I won't. I, 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 I think it's great, I think that that's just great, but I'm not gonna go. I don't, cool. I, 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 dude, I have barely have enough time to get out the content that I need to like that I'm contractually obligated. Oh, to I hear you, I hear you. Basis, so. It's a fun time though, it's uh, it is people it just is. hanging out, you know, having absolutely. Meeting of the minds. All right, Matt. Thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it. And yep. uh, we'll we'll hit you up once we uh, post the show. Yeah. Thank you. Don't give me a link, and I'll I'll put a I'll put a link to it on the blog. Thank you, Tom. Greatly appreciate it.
Mm-hmm. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to our show on YouTube, Odyssey, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Go to MoneroTalk.live to subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.